Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson on my show, Author to Author, in which I interview Catholic authors in all of the different um, types of writing that they do. And I'm here tonight with Ben Bonger, who is uh, the author of a very interesting book called The St. Nicholas Society. How are you tonight, Ben? I'm great, Cynthia. I hope you're doing well. I am. Thank you. Good. Um, would you like to start us with a prayer? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, since the name of the book is the St. Nicholas Society, I figure it'd be wise to do a prayer to St. Nicholas. Mm -hmm. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O good St. Nicholas, put into our hearts the spirit of childhood. Open my faith to the mystery of God made man. O good bishop and shepherd, help us find our place in this church of ours and to be faithful to the gospel. O good patron of children, sailors, and the helpless, watch over those who humbly look for themselves and for you and bring us all in reverence to the holy child of Bethlehem, where true joy and peace are found. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's a beautiful prayer. Well, thank I you. Really, yeah, I really like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It pays being a baby deacon. <laughs> Actually, deacon in training. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, what is it that led you to write this book? Well, I've always had a, uh, a real love of St. Nicholas, mainly because he seemed at the time, you know, when you're a kid, you think about, you know, Santa Claus, and then you get a little deeper into it and you find out he was a real person or mm -hmm. based on a real person. Right. And uh, the idea of doing good quietly or behind the scenes has always attracted me. Mm -hmm. Being that quiet person, and, hey, who did that for me? And nobody's saying a word. It just mm -hmm. mysteriously happens. Mm hmm uh, my parents fell ill uh, toward the end of their life and were in Clearwater, Florida. Meanwhile, I was living in San Francisco. Uh -huh. I was a full-time opera singer. So I would do a concert or do whatever I needed to do and then fly down there and take care of them. Fly back to San Francisco for two weeks, fly back to Clearwater for a week, back and forth for several years. Sure. And after probably the first six months of doing that. I, I honestly don't know what it was, but I got onto the plane and I had this idea, opened up my iPad. And by the end of the flight, which is about a five hour flight from San Francisco to Clearwater, I had the entire outline of the book done. Wow. Just that fast. I mean, there was there. And from day one till when it was published, very little has changed as far as the actual outline itself. It mm -hmm. came to me in total in that five-hour period of time. Mm -hmm. That uh, sounds like inspiration to me. Well, I'd like <laughs> to say that, but I, I'm always yeah. very, you know, reticent to mm -hmm. say that. But, yeah, sure. it, it really felt like it. It really mm -hmm. felt like somebody sitting on your shoulder and whispering in your ear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah, I think most authors, uh, myself included, take forever to get that uh, outline, and uh, or at least the flow of the book, and then uh, we probably change it twenty times. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. So uh, that really does sound like inspiration. Yeah, it really. Uh, it, it felt like it even at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll be honest, I, I listened to a few other people and I said, well, maybe this should go here, or maybe this should go over here, or maybe Trish this over mm -hmm. here. Every time I did that, it messed everything up. So I put it back mm -hmm. to the original, and mm -hmm. it works. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. So um, tell me about the, um, some of the content or the flow of the book. Well, the book is actually designed to be two independent novels. Okay. One novel is set in present day in San Francisco. The other is the autobiography 
mm-hmm. of St. Nicholas of Myra. Uh, the first story, the present day story, is about a gentleman by the name of Fred. We never find out his last name, and that's on purpose. Um, he's the everyman or every woman. It's, mm-hmm. it's that individual that quite literally has had everything. Uh, very educated, came from not a whole lot, made something of himself, climbed the ladder, had wine, women, and song, had, you know, had the whole package, mm-hmm. and lost it all. Absolutely mm-hmm. de- became pretty much homeless overnight. Uh, with, did some jail time, got out, and didn't know where to go, didn't know how to, how to really live. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was taken in. Uh, by a kindly pastor at St. Dominic's Church in San Francisco, uh, who does have, even today, still have a homeless outreach. Uh, The pastor took a liking to him and helped him along and actually gave him a job, a part-time job, working Mm -hmm. there at the church as somebody who would clean up. And I won't say a sacristan because there weren't really any sacred vessels to be dealt with, Mm -hmm. but he he worked in that maintenance position. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's really a, a story of finding yourself. Uh, it's a story of realizing you're here for a purpose, but you don't really know what that purpose is mm-hmm. until you're opening yourself to everything around you to find out what that purpose is. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the gist of that entire storyline. In the meantime, you find out that life itself isn't isn't meant to be by yourself you Mm -hmm. have to be a part of a community and to be a part of a community doesn't mean you get to hunt and pick as to who these people in your community are going to be Mm -hmm. they are going to come from every possible walk of life and if you're open to it you're going to benefit from it and so will they but Mm -hmm. life is meant to be lived in a community of some type Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. I thought you. Yeah, I initially thought you were going to say in a partnership. Um, well, partnership is is a little different thing that almost mm-hmm. comes down to a contract. This some people will come into your life, and they're meant to be there for a short period of time. Some people come into your life, mm-hmm. and they're there lifelong. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's it really is a a, a give and flow. Mm-hmm. In this story, uh, Fred has basically misfit toy friends. Uh, one is an aging, um, almost call her a tiger mama uh, from China, mm-hmm. who has devoted her entire life, everything, to the success of her children. Mm-hmm. Well, her children have moved as far away from her as they possibly can. They've uh, all become successful. That One's a doctor, one's a psychologist, one's a high-end lawyer. One's in Massachusetts, the other one's in Washington, D.C., and the third is in Miami, Mm -hmm. physically, as far away from mom as they possibly can be. But we also find out they have a very tumultuous life as well. Mm -hmm. And that's, it comes out in the story as to some Mm -hmm. of the reasoning behind that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another person of the misfit toy category would be uh, a woman who is from Guatemala, she mm-hmm. herself is not sure if she is actually a U.S. citizen or if she's here illegally. She doesn't know. Mm-hmm. She lost her mother. She lost her father. She was raised by an aunt who mm-hmm. now is back in Guatemala. So now at a young age, she has to take care of her three cousins. Mm-hmm. And in San Francisco, it's not an easy thing to do with, with the prices yeah. out there. Mm-hmm. So... As you can see, this community of misfit toys get together and really do some amazing things. Mm -hmm. Now, the second story is the autobiography of St. Nicholas. And I took almost a year and a half just to research St. Nicholas is the real St. Nicholas of Myra's life. Mm -hmm. Uh, We find out, you know, he had a really, really rough life. Really rough. Lost both of his parents to the plague when he was probably nine or ten. He was raised by a bishop who was his uncle and his namesake. His name was Nicholas as well. Um, He, of course, was living in the age and time of Diocletian, which was no picnic. Uh, There were 
I torture was the name of the game as far as Christians go. Mm -hmm. And I take you into that world. I did quite a bit of research and actually tamed down mm -hmm. some of the actual torture that Nicholas would have gone through as a Christian. Mm -hmm. I take you through his own soul searching. Um, keep in mind, yes, we stamp, boom, yep, he's a saint on his mm -hmm. head after he's dead. But yeah. while you're still alive, you're, you're trying to make this stuff up as you go. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for faith and for a distinct belief in who he was and what he was there to do, he'd fall away like many people. Mm -hmm. But you see his, his soul searching, especially after being in prison a couple of times, to find out who he really is. And he himself doesn't realize it. It's other people telling him, hey, this is who you are. Mm -hmm. Again, in community. And yeah. the, reason, the reason I wrote it as two separate stories, we always look back to the dusty saints. We look at these big plaster you know, models of, of paragons of virtue in our churches and, and in our houses and along the street side, but we never really see them as human beings. Mm -hmm. We see Nicholas as the human Nicholas first, and then as what got him to be a saint. What mm -hmm. was that inspiration of who he was to mm -hmm. become a saint? Meanwhile, in the Fred story, we see the same things transpiring in Fred's life that are happening in Nicholas's life only, you know, many, many centuries apart. Sure. And again, part of the moral of the story is the more things change, the more they stay the same in those points. Mm -hmm. If you're a good person, if you have faith, if you walk the right way, good things hopefully at some point will happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the nutshell. Yeah. Yeah, so that's very interesting um, when I think of it theologically, because, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, people do read the lives of the saints, but the majority just think of this as, you know, um, holier than thou almost, you know, candy coated. And um, I think it's hard for people to realize, you know, that, uh, that these people went through tortures and were afraid, um, were in pain, you know, and had doubts. I will, give, I will give a general warning. It's, it's rated R in some points. Mm -hmm. I mean, mainly for language and situation. Mm -hmm. um, you have to, and I am not, I, I, by trade, I was an opera singer. Mm -hmm. I told stories for a living. Mm -hmm. as, a, as an opera singer. That's what we do. Sure. Mm -hmm. For me, to really create a role that I was singing in, in Europe or China or the United States or wherever, mm -hmm. I have to become very well acquainted with that character's inner dialogue. What are they thinking? Why are they acting the way they are? Yeah. And that's how this book was written. I had to crawl mm -hmm. inside their heads and find out how would, this piece, how would this person view this situation? What would they do? What would they say? Mm -hmm. It is a long book because it is two novels put together. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've had many people already tell me that have read it, that it reads like a movie script. Mm -hmm. I wrote it mainly through dialogue with bits and pieces of here's where we are, here's the situation, mm -hmm. and here's what we are dealing with. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think any chapter is over 10 to 15 pages long. So it's, it's fairly quick. You're put in that situation, you see it and you move on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's also interesting, your comment about the, uh, the effect of community, because again, theologically, just sitting here, I'm thinking, well, you know, God is a community of three. Right. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's clear that we do need community to, uh, you know, to thrive. Um, and that depending on which community you're in, you're either going to thrive or you're not. And exactly. all can go wrong. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, for me, every, let's, look, the basics are every single person is going to be faced with times of great decision. Yes. Big trials in their life. Everybody. Mm -hmm. For mm -hmm. me, I had half of my tongue cut out due to cancer oh. two and a half years oh. ago. 
So mm-hmm. I have a patch for my left arm is now half of my tongue. Oh. It's how we face and how we react to those situations. How we do that is how we're going to be judged and how mm-hmm. we're going to judge ourselves. Mm-hmm. Do we go into it, oh, woe is me? Do we go into it mm-hmm. a big ball of fear and stay that way? Or do we, like Nicholas, like Fred in this story, do we look through that and see what's on mm-hmm. the other side of this and just move on? Mm-hmm. You know, it, I had uh, cancer three years ago, throat cancer. Yeah. And uh, went through the chemo and radiation, which is just grueling. Oh, and that mask, that wonderful mask that they put you in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The only, the only, oh, that mask, when they screw it down to the table, Uh you're claustrophobic like me. It's really not good. And, oh, oh, I'm right there with you. I'm I'm on stage. I'm never out front for a very good reason. I'm claustrophobic. So everybody's out there next to each other. I'm up on stage. I got all this room around me. But I'll tell you what. My wife helped me through this like you wouldn't believe mm-hmm. in so many ways. After I got somewhat of the all clear, I took the mask mm-hmm. and we went out to the beach and I put it on like basically a head of a dolphin. We did mm-hmm. carvings in the sand of a dolphin with that as the head. Mm-hmm. I used it to scoop out tadpoles out of a creek and took pictures mm-hmm. of that. We made basically we we took mm-hmm. something very scary yeah. and poked fun at it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a very necessary thing mm-hmm. at the time, but yeah. for me, it was a big, a big piece of fear. And by dealing with that with humor, mm-hmm. I don't fear that mask anymore. Yeah, yeah. I similarly, um, my husband really was uh, the strength that got me through this. Yeah, and um, but also at work, you know, I work at the seminary, and people were wonderful. I mean, you know, the, the other woman I were, was working with, because I'd be down there, I'm in Cromwell, Connecticut, but I live in Vermont, they'd bring me soup, you know, because I could swallow it. I mean, so it really was, um, in a weird way, it was actually a positive experience, yeah. because yeah. the people around me would do anything to help me, and I, you know, yeah, yeah. That's right, and you find so, out... You, you don't really want to do. go through it again, though. <laughs> well, I'd rather not. Thank you very much. But you find out that for me in particular, and this is this is devoid of the book at this point. Um, mm-hmm. I gave up entirely. I had ten days to go in chemo, and, oh, yeah. and I, I had my last round of chemo. I mm-hmm. had ten days left of the radiation. I gave up. I just said, "That's it. I'm done." I'm not praying for myself anymore. I'm done. Whatever happens, happens. That's it. Mm -hmm. And it was very strange because once my mind and I internalized that and my soul said, yep, that's it. I'm done praying for myself. Whatever happens, happens. Mm -hmm. I really and physically had this feeling of being lifted up. Yeah. Like all of a sudden I became very buoyant. I became Mm -hmm. very light. Mm Mm-hmm. Things, things weren't dire and dour anymore. Mm-hmm. And it, it came through like a bell hitting me upside the head that this is what they talk about when they say being lifted up in prayer. Yeah, It's a physical, it's not just this cliche that mm-hmm. we constantly use and it's way overused. Mm-hmm. It's a very visceral, real yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. Very unusual. Yeah. I agree. So, yeah, it's, um, it's also, I think, when you think of community with people that, that work in that profession, God bless them. I don't know how they do it. Yeah. Um, amazing. But yeah, but they were wonderful people. Yeah. And, you know, so that you're right when you talk about community. Yeah. Yeah. Everything has community base. I mm-hmm. can go to Europe and enjoy, you know, have, have a great time in Paris or Rome or, or Oslo or wherever I've been mm-hmm. when you're by yourself and you have mm-hmm. nobody to say, Hey, I'm here doing these things or mm-hmm. to share it with anyone. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it's hollow. There there's, yeah. yeah, I'm having a great time, but then you look mm-hmm. back, there was nobody to enjoy it with. Yes. Yes. 
right. again, it doesn't mean you have to have a spouse. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. you have to have boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever with, you mm -hmm. know, in your life. Right. But as a community, friends of any oh, kind, workmates, sure. of, but mm -hmm. a community that you can be open with and, mm -hmm. and be yourself with. Mm -hmm. That's what we're here for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And again, you know, the Trinity is a community. That's right. We have to always remember that. That's right. Yeah, so. And that's the other thing. I, I took a very distinct um, line all the way through the book. Every chapter in my own mind and on paper had at least one, if not two or three points from the catechism mm -hmm. in each chapter. Mm-hmm. And the big thing is the entire story is told quite literally through stories. Mm -hmm. I'm not preachy about this. In fact, I have several friends that are Muslim, several friends that are Jewish, several friends, friends that are pagan mm -hmm. and agnostic. They've read this book and they have all equally enjoyed it. Yeah. Simply because the basic through line is being a good human being. It mm -hmm. has Yes, it's in a structure of being very Catholic mm -hmm. inside the church mm -hmm. using Catholic saint. But the idea is more universal than that. Again, yeah. Catholic, yeah. universal. Mm -hmm. The idea of being a good human being and following certain rules mm -hmm. that are set out in the magisterium, set out in the catechism, set out in the undertow of the storyline. It's, it's basically teaching through one very large parable. Mm, yeah, I like that. That's that's a really great idea, you know. So I think Christ taught us how to do that because he he was always using parables. That's right. That's, yeah, yeah. You know, when you when you when you use a good model, you know, for your yep, material, yep. Yeah, you know, yeah. you're not going to go too wrong. <laughs> Can't have a better one. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's really good. <laughs> so. Um, I wasn't really aware. Uh, I mean, I know some things about St. Nicholas, but I had no idea he had such a, such a rough life. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, he was, it was pretty astounding. He, uh, he was a polyglot. He, he, be, he lived in the Lycian area, Myra, and uh, call it southern Turkey, southern and, and western Turkey on the sea. Mm -hmm. uh, he traveled extensively through that area. Mm -hmm. He, since he was taken in after he lost his parents to the plague, he did travel extensively with his uncle. Mm -hmm. uh, he did go to Palestine. He did visit Egypt several times. Mm -hmm. He did understand at least that we think of or know of seven different languages of the area. Wow. Yeah. Um, he, of course, everybody knows, you know, that he gave gifts at night. So there's the story of the three sisters or mm -hmm. the three daughters. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, and everybody turns it into kind of a cute story now of, of putting either coal or a gift in a sock or in a stocking. Mm -hmm. sure. It was a little more desperate and dire than that. He actually gave some of his fortune uh, to three different younger women for their dowries because mm -hmm. their father was going to have to sell them and basically the entire uh -huh. family into slavery. Mm -hmm. They, they were basically going to be purchased to be uh, prostitutes. Mm -hmm. Hence why he is the patron saint of prostitutes as well. Mm -hmm. um, Such he, a weird combination. Oh, listen, at the, very, at the very end of the book, I have an uh -huh. entire list of well over 90 different things that he's a patron saint to. Mm -hmm. Anything from sailors to prostitutes to children to teachers mm -hmm. to you name it, they're in there. Wow. But he's a patron saint. He's actually one of the largest base of patron saints in the Western lung and the Eastern lung of Catholicism. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. But he, I mean, he he uh, he actually had a dream and foretold of him becoming a bishop. Mm -hmm. He had dreams on a regular basis. He would communicate through dreams as well. Mm -hmm. 
he uh, he actually was at the Council of Nicaea mm-hmm. that helped write the Nicaean Creed and helped helped create when Easter the actual date of Easter was. Mm-hmm. Uh, before then, some people were celebrating Easter in February. Others were in June. Others were in May. It was all over the map. Mm-hmm. So they helped establish when Easter is actually going to be celebrated and based on the Jewish calendar. Mm-hmm. Um, he also was a confidant to Constantine after mm-hmm. Nicaea. Mm-hmm. And he was he was actually known to bilocate, uh, much like mm-hmm. Padre Pio or several others, you know, in mm-hmm. modern times. Mm-hmm. He would be asleep, and but he would still be seen thousands of miles away talking to someone. At the same time, he would be in the storm, actually at the rudder of a boat in the Mediterranean, mm-hmm. keeping it from running onto the rocks. Mm-hmm. All at the same time. Yeah. But, he himself was asleep in his house. Mm-hmm. He was very modest. He didn't believe in, in uh, living in luxury. He mm-hmm. actually lived in a very small, very unaudacious house or mm-hmm. at, uh, at the back of basically a church building, what we would call a church today. Mm-hmm. He was a very, um, hmm, he was very outspoken against paganism and against mm-hmm. the gods mm-hmm. uh, so much so that he, he did get physical at times mm-hmm. with some of the different pagan, um, pagan worshipers in that area. But it was typically in a situation of, Hey, you're doing bad things to good people. Stop that. Mm-hmm. It, it was, it was, I won't say he would, he would start these fights, but he would come to people's defense. And that was the big tied to Constantine. Constantine actually started a social security program way back when, Uh and he would give monies to certain bishops and certain higher officials to disperse actual Roman treasure to take care of the poor, the sick, the Uh widow in the time. And Nicholas was one of those people. Wow. So, yeah, there's a lot to Nicholas that people don't realize. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have to wonder how he became a jolly old man, fat in a wetsuit. <laughs> well, he, I, it's funny, but um, it was brought over to the United States. That story came over to the United States uh, through the Dutch up into mm-hmm. New York. Mm-hmm. And if you take the name Sinterklaas, mm-hmm. Sinterklaas in Dutch means Saint Nicholas. Mm-hmm. Well, over time and not fully understanding Dutch, Santa Claus, Santa Claus, Santa, Santa Claus mm-hmm. came out. Yeah. And the whole idea of a fat little man with a, with a bowl full of jelly belly and <laughs> the, the white whiskers and the, and the pipe and the whole thing was from mm-hmm. Coca-Cola. It was a marketing uh, scheme. Oh, my word. <laughs> it was a marketing scheme. Oh. That whole thing was from them between that and the, the night before uh, night before Christmas uh, poem Mm -hmm. between those two, the poem gave an idea of what he might look like. Mm -hmm. This jolly old guy that gives away gifts. Mm -hmm. And then Coca-Cola took it one step farther and actually drew the picture from Mm -hmm. that poem. Wow. Well, you know, in a way, it's kind of good because everybody knows of him. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. So, you know, people um, might actually go and read some something that will give them that information. You know, so that's that's uh, very positive, I think, in a weird kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the good news is you get to learn that being a saint is not something that's old and dusty yeah. and pushed back to antiquity. People mm-hmm. can and do become saints today. And today, yes. So we wove those two stories mm-hmm. together. And mm-hmm. if you, you can read it as mm-hmm. simply Fred's story, or you can mm-hmm. read it strictly as St. Nicholas's story. And it, it's set out that way in the table of contents. Mm-hmm. Or you can read them together, and you can see the through lines that zigzag back and forth. Mm-hmm. It's woven together like a tapestry mm-hmm. with different, different ideas throughout. Mm-hmm.
Oh, that's that's really impressive. Um, I don't think I've ever come across a book like that before. Uh, like I said, it came to me and in the outline all in one five hour trip. Wow. That's, you know, that's, uh, that's a real blessing. Yeah. It, it, mm-hmm. it, uh, it's been a labor of love. No question of that. A true mm-hmm. labor of love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. Good. So are you going to write some more? I'm working on it right now. I have a possibility of three different things Mm -hmm. stirring around right now. Mm -hmm. Good. So, and they will be, one is similar to the Nicholas story. Uh, I have had, I'm also a knight in the order of Malta. So if you see my name on the book itself, Mm -hmm. it's Ben Bongers KM, Knight of Malta. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've had uh, several people asking for a memoir of basically what happened to me through tongue cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, There were at least five, if not six situations where even the doctors flat out said, that's a miracle because we can't explain this. Yeah. So I've had several requests. I I won't even, you know, a lot of requests. They actually put together somewhat of a memoir through those situations. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm working on something a little, little different, shall we say? Still in the Catholic vein, but still a little bit different. Uh, I don't want to give it away too much yet because it's still mm-hmm. coming into coming into its own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think memoir is um, is an excellent idea. You know, I um, I wrote my own memoir which I think I mentioned in my general email because my mother had uh, tried to abort me in 1949. Oh, my. And uh, chemically. And uh, which always makes me laugh because people talk about how Roe v. Wade, uh, prior to that, there wasn't much abortion. And Mm. there was a lot of abortion. Oh, yeah. Um, You know, and so that's one of the the myths that I try to... um, to repair this is not something new no you know i mean yeah going back well, again yeah. going back to nicholas's day mm-hmm. yeah it, it was rampant back then yes yes and uh certainly in the 40s and 50s uh when women were starting to get out of the house because of world war ii um you know they didn't want to be tied down mm-hmm. uh, that much either so i think certainly that was a component of the uh availability so my grandfather just went down to the drugstore and got an abortifacient mm-hmm. you know for for my mother but um you know i wrote that memoir because um i thought you know it's important for people to know um when they're considering something like this that they're ending not only the child's life it will affect the mother and my mother was a miserable person And it's also that you wipe out that whole line of descent, you know? So if you don't, if you know, if you kill your baby, that baby isn't going to grow up to have children or Mm -hmm. grandchildren or great grandchildren. And, you know, so I, I really did think it was something important from just a common person. You know, my life has not been spectacular. I've, I've been successful, but it's not spectacular. But it's like, okay, here's this everyday woman, and look at this. I would not have gotten to do any of these things that impacted. I've been involved in the academic formation of over 200 priests, you know? So, I mean, right. You know, and I mean, I almost went down the gutter. So, it's, uh, you know, memoir is a very powerful, powerful tool, you know, especially if it's something that you feel led to write. Yeah. And the way you're describing, you're writing, I think it's not like you're just like, oh, well, you know, maybe I'll write this next. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. So well, really and, and even, in your, even in your situation, mm-hmm. eventually your mom had a community to work with. We come back mm-hmm. to the mm-hmm. idea of community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. always there. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I really encourage you to write the memoir because it's well, such I appreciate a powerful that. Thank tool. You. It's a powerful tool. I'll write it if I get to interview with you again. Okay. Well, anything you write, 
please just, uh, <laughs> let Sebastian know or let me know, and I'll be glad to interview you. Great. I love that idea. Right. Very right. good. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. okay. Was there anything else that was that you wanted to communicate that's important before we close? Um, no, I think that's pretty much the gist of what the book is. Uh, so far, it's actually been selling very well. It's on sale mm -hmm. on Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, through En Route, of course. Um, mm -hmm. I, I honestly am very happy with, with what's going on so far. We're going to start mm -hmm. a book tour here pretty soon. Mm -hmm. uh, I am. At, go ahead and just go to benbongers-author.com. Mm -hmm. We'll have an entire list of when, you know, when book tours are or at En Route, either one. Mm -hmm. uh, Sebastian, everybody at En Route have been fantastic. Really, mm -hmm. really great people to work with. Oh, yes, definitely. Really great. Really, yeah. really great. Yeah. Sebastian's but, uh, done a lot for, for Catholic writers. Yeah, he has. Very impressed. Yeah. He really has. Mm -hmm. and it's, okay. it's been a real timing and blessing, especially when he said, well, how about, if we, uh, how about if we actually put this out on Divine Mercy Sunday? Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, okay, let's do it. Let's, let's go. Let, let's yes. get up there and call the Holy Spirit into this. Let's go, baby. Yep, yep, yep. that's great. That's wonderful. So, okay, so let's keep in touch when you do any more writing. I, I certainly want to know about it. And so you're on, I'll take you up on that. And next time okay. I'm up in Vermont, I'm coming by to say hi. I love okay, it. Okay, that would be great. That would be great. Okay, <laughs> so, good. um, so did you want to close us in a prayer? Absolutely, in the name okay. of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen, Lord. As is said in Psalm 127, if the Lord does not build the house, in vain do the builders labor. Watch over us all as we build on your foundation this and every day. And as we pray every night in the divine liturgy, protect us, Lord, as we stay awake. Watch over us as we sleep. That awake, we may keep watch with Christ and the sleep rest in his peace. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you very much for the interview. I found it very enjoyable and very informative. Well, thank you very much. I thank you for your time. Anytime. You take care. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.